Rhetoric of Renaissance by Genesis Altamirano. Um, the Renaissance lasted from the 14th to the 17th century. Um, and the Renaissance was a very important time in European history. Being that it was the rebirth of everybody. Everyone was trying to uh, better themselves and trying to find a way to move up, move on up in the world. And they did this focusing on social mobility. Um, the way that they went about doing this was through style manuals, which was the self-help book of the Renaissance. These, um, these style manuals would tell people how to act and talk, particularly how men and women should act and talk. Um, the most influential style manuals were the Book of Courtier uh, by Castiglione and the Copia by Erasmus. Um, so bodily rhetoric of the, the Book of Courtier. The Castiglione discusses how men and women should act during the Renaissance. Uh, he says that men should be uh, skilled in war making, riding horses, and sport. He should be handsome and possess passion and self-control of a true lover. He also states that men should possess spritatura. And spritatura is carrying oneself in a sort of effortless and nonchalantness. Um, so essentially, spectatura is to act in a manner that makes it seem effortless. Like, it doesn't seem like you're trying too hard. I like, uh, like if you're in an interview and you're nervous, you're not going to point out, you're not going to make it obvious that you're nervous. You're just going to try to push through it and get through the interview and tell your future employer that, like, you know what you're talking about and you know while you're there. Um, so he goes on to say that women should also possess some of the uh, characteristics a man should have, but on top of that, they should also have womanly um, characteristics, like being kind, discreet, and they should manage the husband's property. And also have they have to take care of the house and children and all the other requirements of a quote unquote good housewife. So Castiglione is based mainly focusing on how one physically should um act during the Renaissance. Um when we go on to Erasmus, he focuses more on the way one should speak and write. That not only is does the way that we dress and act matter, but what also matters is the way that we write. And he says that we should write with elegance. And he states, elegance consists of partly Consists partly in the words used by suitable authors, partly in using the right word, and partly using it in the right expression. What clothes, what closes to our body, diction is to expression of our thoughts. Uh, for just as a fine appearance and dignity of the body are either set off to advantage or to disfigure by dress and habit, just so thought is by word. So, what he is stating is that just how one can dress up to look the part, we need to, in a way, dress up our word, our words and the way we speak by embellishing this 
like the way we speak and finding different ways to the way we speak different ways to say things and one of the ways he says that we should do this is through metaphor um he states another method of varying comes from metaphor which is also ca called translatio which means transparent trans in Latin because it transfers one word from its real and proper meaning to one not its own. And so he wants us to find different ways of saying things so that we don't sound repetitive and in a way we sound like we know what we're saying. Uh, he does say that there's a little bit of a danger to this because words can start to lose their meaning and this is what Nietzsche starts to talk about um, Nietzsche is a German philosopher that tells us that uh, what we consider language can in a way be nothing more than lies he's saying that language is an illusion that we all forget is nothing more than that I mean that we forget that language is nothing but metaphor. Now we feel that this is the truth. And we feel obvious, obligated to speak the way we do. So, in a, like throughout the years, we forget that the words we use and the expressions we use were just metaphors and through constant usage of these words, we now consider these truths, and in the long one, long run, they affect us in the way that we see the things that we talk about. Um, we can see metaphor affecting uh, people in Shakespeare's play *Troilus and Cressida*. And *Troilus and Cressida*. We see a lot of uh, women being metaphorized as objects of trade. So in this first statement, we uh, see Troilus talking about Cressida. And he is metaphorizing her as a pearl and referring to himself as a merchant. So he is referring to her as an object to be bought. He's saying that the distance, that they're very far away, but that he'll like sail across the ocean to go to his pearl. And in a way, this is objectifying her as an object to be bought. And it starts, it starts off as a metaphor, but eventually it becomes real when through the usage of this, the, the, these phrases, they actually buy and sell Cressida. And this is kind of the effect that, that Nietzsche is talking about that throughout, by the, by us using constantly these words, we kind of forget that it was all just a metaphor. It was just, it wasn't meant to be taken as literal, but eventually that's what it becomes. Um, Later we see, um, we see Cressida even talking to her, talking about herself as referring to herself as an angel. Um, uh, she refers to herself as an angel. She, in the state, in the second statement, she states that, um, she's saying that men will value her more, m m value more what they can't have. She thinks highly of Troilus, and she loves him, but she can't make it too obvious that she does. In a way, she here is invoking a uh, spritzatura, because even though she is crazy about Troilus, she has to act in a way that doesn't make it too obvious. Because she believes that women are more desired when they play hard to get. She believes that women shouldn't show interest in men so much because once she does, uh, men will stop treating her 
like a queen or like an angel that she talks about. Um, we see that like in this in Troilus and Cressida that in a way women are more valued based based on their purity because in the following statement Hector is talking about um uh, Helen and how she is not worth going back and Helen is pointed out to be this woman that is very flirty quite the opposite of what Cressida is and they don't value her as much nobody really like especially Hector he looks down on her and this is kind of the effects of like what Spretatura has to do like with um in Trailers and Cressida uh Cressida carries herself with that with the values of what Castiglione is talking about but even then so then so she is still traded off as an object and that is the dangers of metaphor but like in today's society it's even worse um we metaphorize women every day and it's you know it's very dangerous because men just objectify women as they please here we have a statement where it says a rose has a petal beautiful and pure a rose not a rose is not as beautiful without its petals this is referring to a woman losing her virginity um the same thing happens in Troilus and Cressida when they find out that Cressida isn't a virgin anymore um they get very upset and they're and they lose interest in her as she predicted but this is even more so in today's society because women are shamed for having multiple partners or being with multiple men throughout her life um and then a few other uh metaphors that i've seen used that objectify women are referring to uh, women as a uh, doll face kitten fox these are all like uh, treating women as an object and in a way stating that women are objects that men can manip manipulate as they please and these metaphors and influence the view on women and even how women view themselves so we as a society need to stop and be aware of the language that we use and when we use it thank you